Hello everybody. In the last video we talked about heredity, which is the study of how characters and traits are passed on from generation to generation. And uh, we also talked about the difference between a character and a trait. We talked about the fact that characters are specific features that you're studying, something like eye color, skin color, hair color, hair uh, shape, and things like that. And that the actual specific example of that character or what you have, you would call it a trait. For example, I have, I have a white or fair skin with a, a brown, brown ha hair and brown eye color and my hair is kind of wavy. And so you have these traits or specific types of a character, like the color pattern of a cat is, the, is a character, but the actual color is the trait. Just like a, a flower color or flower shape are characters. The actual trait would be the flower flowers color like pink like red like yellow and so forth and people were to understand how that worked and for many years people thought that the way it worked is that a blending happened so the idea is that basically the what um, someone's traits mixed with the traits of someone else when they had babies together so for example you see on the left side what a lot of um, scientists are not considering the face of America and this was produced uh, at the request of the Time magazine, also it was published in the Time. Sorry, it was published in the Time magazine recently. And basically, what they, they did there is they blended the most common features found in face of American people to create the new face of America, based on what's happening with immigration that's bringing in new genes, which is causing up and also the or our predilections are causing a small evolution in the American population that is making it look more like this. I like it. It looks pretty nice. Now, uh, just for fun, I wonder what would happen if you were to mix in Robert Pattinson and Taylor Lautner, so get a little bit of the vampire and a little bit of the hotness of the uh, bear wolf, and what do you get? Well, you get something pretty cool and hot, right? Uh, no, not really. You can't change a perfect face, so you should just stick with the Taylor Lautner face. But uh, that's what you would see if you blending were to take place. In Photoshop, you can easily do that with between two facial features. But if blending happened, it would be like a color change. You know, when you get a, a blue and yellow and mix them together, you get green. And so you make something new out of the combination of both parents. Now, that does make some sense, and that's why a lot of people thought it was. But let's think about what that would happen if you were to do that. If you get blue and yellow, you make green, right? You see that on the color wheel. If you get blue and red, you make something like purple. If you make yellow and red, you see some make something like orange. But what happens if you get that orange and you mix with the blue? Well, then you make something that looks like a brown. But what happens if you get the green and you mix with the red? Well, you also make something that looks like brown. Well, what happens if you get something like the uh, uh, the purple and mix with your yellow? Well, you also get something like brown. So you see. If we really truly blended our genes together when we have kids, after a few generations, everybody will look how? The same, right? So genetically, let's look at this genetically. Um, the blending theory basically would say, you can see that on the top left here, that two people with different genes will basically donate their genes and the new look will be a blend of both looks. But that when that blended with somebody else's blend, you essentially get a new blend still. And that's basically the idea of how that would work. Now, in Mendelian genetics, we, we, th we think of it as differently. We think about the fact that each parent uh, gives particles, which we combine in different ways to create who you are. So it's the idea of particle genetics, or the idea that um, these particles are separated and never truly mixed together. And it's by the combination of different particles that makes you who you are. But those particles don't necessarily mix. And that means when you get passed on those particles, you may pass one or the other, but not a blend between the two. And so that creates a variability instead of creating the same color. And you see what's happening there with the, on the top bottom right corner, the difference between them. If you have multiple colors and you blend them, after a few generations, the blend will cause everyone to look the same. But if you have particle genetics, that's never going to happen. The variation is going to be preserved across many generations. And that's what we see in the human race. Clearly, we're not all the same, but we have very, very lots of differences. And so, why, we learned in the previous chapter that this whole process happens through meiosis. And because of the separation of homologs and crossing over, variation is maintained across generations. And genes stored in the chromosome, which is the feature in the middle, are passed on from generation to generation. Now, the people who first understood and uh, studied this didn't know about all this genetic of the chromosome and meiosis and all this stuff. 
but the first person to actually figure out that things don't blend but are passed through particle genetics was a guy called Austrian, an Austrian monk that, uh, named Gregory Mendel. And he did most of his work in the, what, where it is now Czech Republic, and you actually actually see the, the monastery where he used to live and the area that used to be his garden. Right here at the corner of the monastery, he used to build a garden. And he studied for many, many years several experiments. And this is an actual picture of the experiment that uh, he created and put in his book. And so, on uh, his notes, sorry. And so, uh, it's funny because he, he, he died kind of in obscurity. Nobody really uh, knew about him. And it was much later, uh, many years later, actually, 40, 40 years later or so, that his work was rediscovered. And he actually sent his work to uh, Darwin. And uh, most people think that Darwin never even opened his, his work. And that's a shame because Darwin could really have benefited a lot from his work. Darwin didn't really understand how evolution happened and, and uh, what actually caused the very variation that was necessary to drive his evolution machine that he called natural selection. But between Darwin and, and, and Mendel, these are perhaps the most famous biologists of all time. And both of them are research-based biologists which changed the history of biology forever. And so, um, definitely a very important scientist. And, and what did he do? What did Mendel do? So let's talk about that. He studied heredity. He, he, he basically worked with pea plants. And uh, pea plants are look like what you see here in, in the... In the, in the screen and you see the the actual shoot of the pea plant and the roots of the pea plant and you see that they have these pods where the peas will actually grow and they have these leaves which are can be broad broad leaves usually and they and they have flowers also like nice purple flowers and so that's a pea plant and that's what he used to study that's what he grew in that garden that I showed you in the previous video now he spent seven years studying the, f the features of that pea plant. And he studied several different characters, or, and, which had different traits. But the cool thing about pea plants is that they have very discrete characters. Unlike humans, which have uh, characters like eye color, skin color, hair color, which are made of multiple thousands of different things, the, the characters of, of, of pea plants are very simple. Either you, either you have a spherical shape or a wrinkled shaped uh, pea. Either you have a yellow pea or you have a green pea. Either you, the, color, the flower is purple or the flower is white. Either the plod looks inflated or it looks constricted. It's either green or yellow. The flower is either on top or on the sides. The stem is either high or short. And so these distinctive seven traits is what he studied. And it took him seven years to study all those traits and make sense out of how they worked. And basically, he had to go through thousands of plants and thousands of, 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 of regenerations of plants until he actually figured out patterns of inheritance. And he noticed that there was something going on here that was determining the way the flowers look. He was understanding that when you mix certain flowers, you always get different, certain ratios. For example, every time you get a purple versus a white flower, you get a 3 to 1 ratio of purple to white. Every time you get an axial versus terminal flower, you get a 3 to 1 ratio of axial. Every time you mix a yellow with a green, you get a 3 to 1 ratio of yellow. So he noticed that one of the traits seemed to dominate over the other and get a 3 to 1 ratio after two generations. It's what's interesting about this. After two generations, all these traits, look at, look at them. All these traits pretty much showed a 3 to 1 ratio. But look at how many plants that he have to grow to actually analyze each trait when he did each trait separately. And that's why it took him so many years to do it. Um, to actually get these ratios. If you only do it a few times, you miss the pattern. So he had to do this many, many times. And it was a lot of research that it took him to do it until he finally saw the pattern. But I mean, after he put his data together and he saw this, he saw there was a pattern here. That after two generations, one of the traits was three times more common than the other on, a, on, on average. And you see that uh, on average, this is actually true. And so this is actually what opened his eyes to realize that there's actually a pattern of inheritance that no one realized before. And it wasn't blending that was happening. It was something else because after two generations, two generations, people don't look, all the peas didn't look the same. Instead, they looked different. So he realized that it couldn't be blending. They had to be doing something else. And he was the father of particle genetics. And he pretty much got it right. Everything I'm teaching you in this lecture series is Mendel's idea. Nothing new that I'm going to, 
has come out about that. So Mandel has come, figured all of this out. So it's pretty amazing that he actually came up with all of this basically by researching peas. And you can actually do this today. We have something called Wisconsin Fast Plants. And if you want to do level five on that, you can we can go outside, uh, we can plant a garden, and they will grow very, very fast. And so you can actually test in two generations of pea plants what Mandel said and see if you get a three to one ratio. It's pretty amazing. Now, um, why did he use pea plants? You know, why did he use these pea plants? Uh, why did he choose something else to study? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, the pea plants can reproduce very fast because they make very a lot of seeds, a lot of pods. They also grow very fast. So that means that you don't have to wait uh, many years between generations. If you were doing do, do this with humans, each generation of human is minimal, usually about 13 years because you have to hit puberty before you can have a child. So the minimal will be 13 years, but on average, a human generation is 25 years. Can you imagine tracking many generations of this? And you would have to do this with thousands of people, and since most people only have one kid at a time, it, instead of a piece, they have multiple kids at a time, it would take thousands of years to study the same thing that he studied using peas, and that's why he used peas. He also, unlike humans, where the, where the characters are determined with traits which are polymorphic or have multiple features, in the piece, it's either one way or the other. So you have these seven very discrete, very clear traits, which is one, it's like has or tails, and which means it's much easier to understand what's happening there than what it is in humans. Also, something crucial for pea plants, and we'll talk about why this is important later in the lecture, but pea plants actually have the ability of crossing with themselves. Their flowers have both the male and the female parts inside the flower which allows you to actually do something that's called self-pollination or having the plant have sex with itself. And by doing that, Mendel could control the actual um, sexual production of the plant and make sure that he knew what was happening there. He can control, remember, you want a control experiment. And we're going to talk about how he did that in, in, uh, in the next video. Uh, and so after many years of studying this, he actually found his solution. He figured out that there was not blending, that instead some magic particle was being carried from generation to generation. Something was happening at the, and we're going to talk about how he figured this out in the other video, but he figured out that a particle carried by mom, carried by dad, and given to you was causing you to be who you are. And that was by, by the combination of particles between your mom and your dad that created who you are. Mendel called this a uh, factor. And later on, when we discovered the DNA molecule, we called those genes. And then we named the field genetics, which is a study of genes. Um, so Mendel is called the father of modern genetics or part of particle genetics because he figured out that instead of blending, you passed on genes by giving a small particle which combines with a particle of the other parent and then a combination which is different from blending. It's not like you get sugar and salt and make a new, a new, uh, you, you make a new flavor, but you still have the sugar and the salt separate from each other. You didn't make a new spice. You understand what I'm saying? So that is how it works and that is what Mandel figured out. Now, what he actually figured out was trying to understand the problem that he had when he first looked at the flowers, was this. Sometimes he would get a purple flower and a, and a white flower, and he would get purple flowers. Sometimes he would get a purple flower and a white flower, and he would get both purple and white flowers in the children. Sometimes he would get flowers that were purple and mixed them with himself, and he made all kinds of flowers, purple and white. Sometimes he got purple flowers, mixed them with himself, and he got purple flowers. So he was like, what's the, what happening here? I mix the same flower with itself, and it makes different things. But other times, it makes the same thing. And so he, he saw that it, it, it didn't make sense. It doesn't seem to make sense. How can I get different results different times? What is happening here? Well, the answer was that he discovered that there was two ways of being red, for example. Why is it that one time you put red versus red and you get and you get all the colors, red and white, but sometimes you get red versus red and you get red. That's because there's two different ways of being red. He discovered what he would call the heterozygous genotype. And we'll talk about what that is in the next video. 
But by discovering that there was two different ways of being read, it opened his mind to understanding this whole process of particle genetics. Now, he didn't know about the actual chromosomes and that genes were stored in DNA. That came much later. But he already discovered, opened the door for the discovery of this gene because people start to search for this mystical particle that he discovered and talked about later. And so that is Mendel Genetics. And the next video, we're actually going to talk about how it works.